Good morning. We'd like to welcome you to the Friendship Sunday School class of TAP Methodist Church here in New Boston, Texas. My name is Tim Graham, and we're uh, still in our uh, lesson, Lead Us Not in Temptation. This is lesson number three, and uh, we're going to be reading out of Deuteronomy and, and Matthew this morning. But it, uh, the title of the lesson is The the Devil Knows the Bible Too. Uh, we're in the uh, part of the the Bible where Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days, and he was tempted by the devil there at the end. And we're in the second part of that temptation today where the devil took him to the highest point there at the temple and uh, said, throw yourself down and uh, God will save you. He will give the angels care of you where you won't brush your foot against even a stone. But anyway, we're in that part of the story uh, this morning. So if you've got your Bibles handy, keep them closed. We're going to turn to that here in a moment. We're going to uh, lift up a few prayer concerns this morning. Keep Glenda Howell in your prayers. Uh, I'm not sure if she's out of the hospital yet, uh, but she's slowly but surely getting better, according to her son, Jimmy, uh, who I talked to on Friday at Aggie Muster. Uh, so just keep uh, continue to keep her and Wilbert in your prayers. Uh, continue to keep our city elections in, our, uh, in your prayers, because they're coming up pretty soon. They'll be the, the uh, first uh, Saturday there in May. Uh, we had a meet the candidate uh, uh, event yesterday that the New Boston Chamber of Commerce sponsored, and it was a great event to get to meet the the candidates that are running against the incumbents, and also to uh, to talk with the school about the uh, bond elections that are that are coming up. So pray for leadership, pray for guidance uh, here in the uh, in the town of New Boston, and and throughout the United States where elections are going on as well. If you've got a prayer concern that you'd like to lift up, you can. Put it here in the comment section and we can pray for you corporately as well. Continue to keep Kim Taylor and Maggie Snyder in your prayers. They're still, they're still looking for kidney transplants and uh, uh, also Kobe Towns. Uh, he's uh, doing dialysis uh, every day at home, uh, but it would sure be more convenient if uh, he had a kidney transplant as well. So keep all those uh, people in your prayers. If you've got your Bibles handy, uh, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 16 through 25. Deuteronomy 6, 16 through 25. Do not test the Lord your God as you did at Massah. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight so that it may go well with you and you may go in and take over the good land that the Lord promised on an oath to your forefathers. And then we'll, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, we'll keep reading. Uh, thrusting out all your enemies before you as the Lord said. In the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord your God has commanded you? Tell him. We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent miraculous signs and wonders, great and terrible, upon Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out of, from there to bring us in and give us the land that he promised on, on oath to our forefathers. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive as in the case today. And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. And then we'll turn to Matthew chapter four, verses five, and seven, five through seven. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we're thankful that... Uh, that we have this time to study your word and to reflect on your intentions and to, to learn lessons from the people of Israel, from the miracles that you've already done and from the, your holy word that we study. And Lord, we'd ask that you open our eyes and our hearts and our 
minds to what you want the, us to hear today, that it may go well with us and our future generations as we obey your decrees and your laws and that we set forth to, to please you. And Lord, we'd ask that you be with the ones that we've mentioned this morning that are facing serious health consequences, Lord, that you would give them a peace and comfort that, uh, that their story's already been written, that you know uh, their, their outcome, their, that uh, they're going to be used for your purpose, and they give their families peace concerning this as well, because Lord, it's in times of uncertainty when we learn to lean on you, when we learn to have faith and trust in you. And let us not be complainers. Let us not complain about our lot in life because you have given each and every one of us a purpose to witness to one another, to encourage one another, to spread your word, to lift up the miracles that you have performed. And Lord, help us to be patient. Patient with uh, our development process and, and where we are in our life story. Because Lord, sometimes we have to walk by faith because we can't see. But Lord, it's in during those times when we need your strength the most. And we'd pray for that this morning, that your Holy Spirit would come and encourage us and lift us up in our times of need. All these things we'll ask in your name. Amen. We uh, we touched on last week the, uh, the way the devil approached Jesus uh, out in the wilderness and and, and challenged him to uh, to turn the lo the stone into loaves of bread. You know, and he prefaced that with, if you are the son of God, you know, turn these stones into bread and feed yourself. Well, he was addressing a physical need, hunger, and also the divinity of Jesus Christ. You know, if you are the son of God, then surely you can show people that you can do this. Well, that failed. And he comes at him today uh, with scripture. And, uh, you know, the devil knows the Bible. He, <laughs> he's very familiar with the Bible and he takes these verses out of context. He doesn't really give Jesus the full story. He doesn't give, uh, the reader, the full story, the full scripture verse, but he tempts Jesus again, said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from this high point at the temple and rescue yourself before you hit the hit the ground because God's going to send you angels to protect you. And Jesus replies, yes, it is also written that we shall not put the Lord our God to a foolish test. And it would have been a foolish test. But uh, whereas the devil approached Jesus in solitude the first time, just, hey, turn these uh, stones into bread. Nobody will know. Nobody's around. Nobody will see. What he's tempted to do now is do this in front of a crowd. Because the highest point in the temple is at the southeast corner where the main road meets the plaza for the temple. And people are traveling down this main road. They're congregated right here at the entrance in the, of the plaza to the temple. So there's a lot of people around. So if he were to jump uh, from 143 feet up, about 15 stories, there would probably be some people that would you know, be pretty impacted by that if he all of a sudden he just didn't fall to his death. Uh, there would be a lot of witnesses, uh, a lot of people that would see this and word would quickly spread throughout Jerusalem. But, but Jesus wasn't interested in doing that. He didn't want to do anything. He didn't want to put God to the foolish test and he's not encouraging us to do that either. And you may say, well, where in the world does it talk about? Well, they will send angels to guard over you. Well, if we'll turn over to Psalm 91, uh, we're going to read verses 11 and 12. And it says, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift up in their you in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And what's critical in there, the devil left out the verse to guard you in all your ways. And what that intends for us to, to read is that going about our daily lives, that God will continue to watch over us, but he's not gonna, he's not gonna guard us from doing something foolish to ourselves, something that would defy the law of, uh, laws of nature or laws of physics. 
Because when Gabriel was looking for a signal <clears throat> that God was with him, he said, hey, I'm going to lay this fleece on the ground overnight. And if you're really talking to me, let the fleece be dry in the morning and the grass around it covered with dew. And when that was the case, Gabriel wanted another sign. He said, well, wait a minute. He said, tell you what, dude, let's turn the fleece over. And in the morning, I want it to be wet with dew and all the surrounding grass to be dry. And again, it was so. It didn't have anything to do with Gabriel. It had everything to do with the fleece that he was setting out. And what Jesus is trying to tell us to do, don't put yourself in a dangerous situation where God is going to come to your rescue. Don't do that. Don't put the Lord your God to a foolish test. Uh, don't put a gun to your head and say, pull the trigger and say, God, if, if, if you want me to live, don't, don't let me be killed. Don't, don't do that. And that's what Jesus is trying to get across to us this morning. Don't put yourself in a foolish position like that to, to, to put God to the test. From Jesus's temptation, we learn that following our Lord can bring dangerous and intense spiritual battles and our victories may not always be visible to the watching world. We must use the power of God to face temptation and not try to withstand it with our own strength. If Jesus had done this, it probably would have been quite the spectacle. If he had thrown himself down from the highest point in the temple, but contrary to God's plan and outside of scripture's intended promise of protection. This, uh, you shall not put the Lord your God to a test. This quote comes from Moses' farewell address to the nation of Israel, warning against their habit of trying the patience and providential care of the Lord God. And, and if you'll remember uh, back in Deuteronomy and Exodus, when the, when the Israelites were leaving Egypt, time and again, they complained to God. Why did you bring us out here in the desert to let us starve to death? At least when we were in Egypt, we had plenty of food to eat and, and we weren't worried about starving. You know, and, and God always provided for the people of Israel, always in every way, through water, through manna, through clothing, through shelter, everything, but they always complained. And he eventually got tired of it. And that's why they spent 40 years in the desert to where that generation of complaining Israelites would not get to enter the promised land. And it's the same with us. So our lives are not going to be perfect. There, it's not going to be a Garden of Eden in every aspect of our life because it's only when there's adversity in our lives that we get to turn to God that we realize how grateful he is and that was the reminder in this morning in Deuteronomy where Moses is talking about all the things that God did all the 10 plagues that he sent upon Egypt in the first place he wanted the kids the grandkids and, and future generations to remember the story of the 10 plagues and what happened when they, uh, they left Egypt. I mean, that Pharaoh had his heart, had, had his heart set on not releasing the Jews. But the one deal breaker was when the angel of death swept through the land and killed the firstborn of all the people who did not have blood on the doorway, who had not had, uh, the, the sacrificial meal, the Passover meal that night. And the angel of death killed all the firstborn of, of the animals and the, and the, and the people and everything. And that's what it finally took. It wasn't the locust. It wasn't the frogs. It wasn't turning the Nile, uh, from fresh water into blood. It wasn't any of that. The, the deal breaker was the angel of death. And so they wanted that story told over and over again to remind the people of what great links God went to, to free the Jewish people from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. This quote comes from his address trying to warn them against their habit of complaining. Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 6.16 as a sharp rebuke to Satan himself, indicating that in tempting Jesus, the devil was putting the Lord God to the test. <clears throat> what is actually Was it actually possible that Jesus could have sinned? No. No, Jesus was holy. He was fully divine. So it's going to be impossible for Jesus to sin. It's impossible for God to sin. He could be tempted by Satan and feel the full force of the temptation. But Jesus was simultaneously full, fully God. He could not sin. He was going to be victorious over the temptation 
but that doesn't make the temptation less real. And to give you an example, a person can take uh, a ball peen hammer or a sledgehammer and pound against a 12 inch thick steel wall over and over and over again with every ounce that they have. But the nature of the steel wall is such that it will not succumb to the pounding. And so it is with temptation. We can tempt Jesus. We can tempt God all day long, but it doesn't make any difference in the end. It will have no effect on uh, the God or Jesus because they are fully divine. You know, I've already talked a little bit about how did the temptation this week differ from the one of turning uh, stones into bread last week. The second temptation put the father's love and power to the test. Okay. Because the devil was saying that somebody was else was going to have to intervene. In the first one, Jesus could have turned the, the stones on the bread on his own. He, he didn't have to have anybody's help. But on the second one, if he threw himself down, then he was going to have to have some intervention from the angels, or this is what the devil was alluding to, that he was going to have to have some interference from the angels and from his heavenly father. This time, it wasn't about satisfying Jesus's physical needs. It was about attracting a crowd, instantly promoting his fame and gaining the attention and adoration he rightly deserved as the son of God. And so Satan had Jesus make his way to the pinnacle, which was 164 feet uh, above the road, 15 stories. And probably the, uh, the ledge overlooked the busiest roads and entrances up to the temple on both its southern and western sides. In other words, there would have been a crowd of people, and they might not have been looking up, but you can imagine the crowds that gathered on the main road that walked into Jerusalem every day. You know, you, you think about a, a city sidewalk in New York City or Chicago or, or someplace like that, where it's primarily foot traffic all day long, and that's what it looked like on this day in Jerusalem. But the key with Satan is, in this scripture that he quoted from Psalm 91, is he left a critical point out. He left out the uh, the part about he will give his angels con uh, charge concerning you as you go about your daily life. Okay? He left out as you go about your daily life because he wanted he wanted to take the scripture out of context. He wanted the people to believe that the angels of, of God would protect Jesus no matter what he did. To bolster the temptation, he quoted scripture, but he only quoted the first two lines. The devil left out an important part in the middle to guard you in all your ways. And this text indicates that the promise of protection was related to accidents that could occur in the course of a person's normal comings and goings, not to intentional attention-grabbing stunts, that put oneself in danger. You can think about as you get in your car to travel back and forth to work every day, that if you get in an accident with another vehicle, that you will be protected, that God will watch out after you in the course of your everyday life. But if you're driving down the, the highway at unreasonable speeds and swerving and driving dangerously, does that promise still come into effect? Well, it could or could not, but you're putting the Lord your God to it foolish tests by doing foolish things. And that's not what he asks us to do. Satan wanted to test his relationship with God to see if God's promise of protection would prove true, but he was quoting it out of context, making it sound as though God protects anyone, even if they attempt to defy natural law. And Satan still does that today. People take, pastors take scripture out of context to uh, make every Christian believe that they will receive enormous financial blessings. That's not always the case. Uh, matter of fact, they, Jesus never promised uh, that he would enrich Christians with rich spiritual blessings, with monetary uh, you know, compensation. He never promises that. But there are plenty of pastors, plenty of preachers today that will take verses out of context to say that. God wants us to live by his decrees, his laws and commands. And he makes that perfectly clear in Deuteronomy this morning. Okay. But there are pastors today that will take uh, scripture out of context to say that God is all about love, that Jesus is all about love. Yes, but they're also all about accountability. They want us to abide by 
the decrees and the commands they've set forth. So for a preacher to tell us that God is going to love us no matter what, yes, that's true. His love extends to us as far as the east is from the west and the north is from the south, but there's accountability in there. He does not want us to go out there and willfully sin so that we will test his love. That's not what God and Jesus are calling us to do. But society will tell you that. Today's modern Christianity will tell you that. That you can do anything that you want to and you will not fall out of God's love. And that is simply not true. Because there are many examples in the Bible with the case of the exodus from Egypt and the Israelites, with the case of David and Bathsheba. With, uh, there's numerous cases, even with Lot and his wife, that they, Lot and his wife and their two daughters escaped Sodom and Gomorrah. But there was one rule that God said when he took the family out of there. He said, don't look back. Well, Lot's wife turned around and looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. So the only ones to make it really out of Sodom and Gomorrah were Lot and his two daughters. So there's plenty of stories in the Bible about accountability and obeying what God says, but too many preachers today, the devil is in their minds and wants to tell them, wants to preach to their flock, that it doesn't matter what you do, God's going to love you and he's going to forgive you and he's going to let you spend an eternity with him in heaven. And that's simply not true because Jesus tells us that on the final judgment day that the sheep will gather up on the right and the goats on the left and the goats will go to hell and the sheep are going to be admitted into the kingdom of heaven there's always accountability associated with the love that jesus and god offer us and we need to read the whole bible we need to be familiar with scripture where we are not deceived by the devil into thinking that we've got a license to sin well, why can't you, why, why can't we just read the Bible without interpreting? Why is that so important? Taken out of context, Philippians 4.19 can appear to be an absolute promise of God to supply every Christian's financial need. And let us, we're going to turn over Philippians 4.9 and, uh, and read this real quick. It says, whatever you have learned or received or heard, let's see, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Okay. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace be with you. So it's talking about some holy things. It's talking about how we need to behave. And we need to take that in context. We don't need to take that out of context. It's 419. I'm sorry, not 49. I apologize. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. So if, if you take that verse out of context and you you think that every Christian is going to be rich with blessings, but that's just not true. The promise of God's financial blessing was made to those who themselves had given generously and sacrificially. Paul was talking about the Philippians that had put the needs of others before their own, and they had given to the church <clears throat> to uh, that the they understood the principle that all that we have comes from God, and they used what was theirs to bless others. So they sacrificially gave. It's if uh, it's kind of like the woman at a temple who gave only two copper pennies and Jesus made the remark, well, she gave everything she had while these others that, that came in and gave these larger amounts gave out of their abundance, but she gave everything that she had. And this is what Paul is talking about this morning, that the Philippians were blessed, not so much financially, but their, but their church was blessed. Their people were blessed with good health. And so if you have needs, be a Philippian, develop a lifestyle of blessing others, and then look for God to bless you. It happens in that order where you bless others and then God will turn around and bless you. <clears throat> but we don't need to take these verses out of context. We don't need 
to, uh, to, to read these verses and, and not understand the story that leads up to them. And that's what the devil was trying to do with the temptation this morning, that even if you do put God to a foolish test, he will send his angels uh, to take charge over you and you will not be harmed. And that's not true. <laughs> that's just not true. In spite of the Israelites' repeated whining in De Deuteronomy, God repeatedly provided for them fresh water, fresh meat, manna from heaven, and even a day to rest. Man, that sounds like a pretty good life. You know, and that doesn't say anything about where they were living, where they were out in the desert, but it sounds like a pretty good life when you didn't have to worry about water, you didn't have to worry about food. You got manna from heaven every day, and then on Sunday, you were required to rest. God didn't want you working on that day. Your clothes didn't wear out. Your feet didn't swell. There were all kinds of things that happened with the Israelites out in the desert, but they still complained. Even when Moses went up on the, the mountain and he was gone for 40 days, it only took 40 days for the Israelites to turn to Aaron and said, hey, we don't even know if Moses is coming back. We don't know if God's going to let him come back or he even died on the mountain. Make us something else to worship. So they couldn't even go 40 days without fastening the golden calf and worshiping to Baal. How, how appreciated do you think God felt with the Israelites out in the desert? They were a hard-hearted people that refused to, to look at all the blessings that God had put in their life, and they continually turned to other gods. But we do the same thing. We turn to material gods. We, we turn to physical gods. We turn to, to, to money, to things like that, that have no provision, that will not provide for us, instead of God. And it's rampant in our society today. We look for the government to take care of us, to provide us shelter, to provide us food, to bail us out, to provide defense. We look for all those things from the United States government or whatever uh, government we're a citizen of, instead of turning to God. And it's quite apparent that God is the only one that can protect us because when things really start falling apart, and you think there's no hope left, who do we turn to? We turn to God because he's the one with all the answer. He's the one who knows how the story's written. And in our feeble minds, we can't quite comprehend the one that's responsible for all of this. We continue to complain about our lot in life, no matter what that one thing is. I mean, we can, we can have perfect health. Our kids can have perfect health. We can have the nice house, the nice cars, the nice material things, but if there's something missing, whatever that one thing is, whether it's not enough money or not the right kind of car or not the right home, whatever it is that we want to gripe and fuss and complain about, we find that area to harp on. We find that area to focus on. We are much like the ungrateful Jewish people walking around in the desert who were provided for in every way that still found a way to complain to God. The question from the Hebrews tongues often sums up our expe own expectation. Is the Lord really among us? Just put this assumption to logic. Must God really follow our rules? Do our circumstances prove God's faithfulness? Or do circumstances occur to prove our own? We put God to the test when we get these backwards. Do our circumstances prove God's faithfulness, or do our circumstances occur to prove our own? It proves our own. We get ourselves into the situations that we're in. We don't need to put God to the test. God, if you will only rescue me from this, I won't do this anymore. God, if you will help me in this out in this situation, I have finally learned my lessons. God's presence among us doesn't always prove itself by our standards. He may not be coming to our rescue because we put him to a foolish test. But the same Lord who gave the Israelites water from the rock also promised us, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. There are enough promises and reassurance in the Holy Word of God in the Bible for us to know that God will always be with us, but we cannot and should not put him to foolish test. 
We should not paint ourselves into a corner or back ourselves into a situation and expect God to rescue us. That's not what he's about. He's not about us putting him to a test. In Exodus 17, verses 1 through 7, the first generation tested God's patience by complaining about not having water to drink at a place called Massah and Meribah, which means testing and quarreling. The people had threatened to stone Moses, and they questioned whether God was even with them. Though God did provide water on that occasion, the fact that they pushed the limits of his patience is evident in the psalmist's reflection on this event. And we're going to read out of Psalm 95, verses 8 through 11. I hope I get this right this time. Forgive me for not (laughs) getting it right the last time. But in Psalm 95, verses 8 through 11, it says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did at Massa in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years, I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger. They shall never enter my rest. And God was talking about the fact that they will never make it into the promised land, that generation, because he was so angry with them at all their complaining and all the things that they had done that he vowed he would never let that generation go into the promised land. And he kept his promise. And Moses was not the one to lead them into the promised land. Joshua was. So he didn't even let Moses go into the promised land. What did putting God to the test look like in that case? They complained about water. They complained about meat. They complained about the manna. And what did God do when they complained about the manna? He sent them quail until they absolutely gorged themselves and got full and sick of quail. But he finally put them to the test enough where he just didn't have any more patience with them and he didn't let them into the promised land. It was a second generation that got to go in there. What do we learn about complaining in, uh, in God's, <clears throat> to God in this passage? Well, we learn that complaining reaches God's ears. He hears everything. We learn that complaining makes God angry. We learn that complaining to human leader, leaders may be no better than complaining to God. We learn that complaining can lead to destruction. We, we learn that complaining may arise from physical wants. We often think about complaining is often tied to the good old days. And, and of course, I've been guilty of that time and again. Because I remember back as a youth, my worries weren't nearly as much as they are as an adult. Well, is that due to our times or is that due to the situation I find myself in now with a family and, and trying to raise kids? Complaining can ignore the good things that are present. And this is what I find to be most evident in my life because when I'm focused on the one or two things that I don't have, I miss the thousands of things that I do. Complaining may affect whole families, and it did in the Israelites' case. Their parents and grandparents didn't get to walk into the promised land with grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Complaining often affects leaders as well as followers. How many times did Moses get uh, fed up and and tired of the Israelites? Why did you send me these hard-hearted people, God? Why did you send me to Egypt to lead these people out? Complaining can can often deteriorate into self-pity, and complaining may arise from feelings of being overwhelmed. Do you often feel that you're in your that you're into your rope? You can't control any things, and that's a big deal with our society today. We feel like we've got to control everything. We feel like we've got to be the ones in power. And you don't need to look at any further than the corruption in our government today and realize that the 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 people, the voters often feel overwhelmed because they can't control the corruption that's going on in our own government. And so they lash out, not only at the government, but but also at other people. And complaining may arise from feelings of personal and faith inadequacy. Uh, I mean, are you struggling in your marriage? Are you struggling at work? 
Do you feel like that you can uh, meet your spouse's expectations of a mate? Do you feel like you can meet your employer's request as an employee? And probably not. Probably not because corporations are making more and more demands on their people because there's fewer and fewer employees that want to work. And there's more people that want to earn a higher income thinking that they deserve this higher income, that they deserve these higher benefits without offering uh, a a valuable uh, asset to the company. Complaining can also lead to self-deprecation, even despair. Well, how big a deal is complaining? It's huge. It's a sin. And you may think, well, complaining is a sin? The word literally means missing the mark, failing in regard to God's holy standard and just demand. So equating complaining with sin puts complaints in a dangerous category. But you may be thinking to yourself, it may be a great thing, but a sin really, you know, we're talking about lying. We're talking about murdering. We're talking about stealing, putting that on the same level as complaining. Who am I hurting? Who am I really hurting when I complain? Well, first of all, you're hurting yourself. When you complain, you're choosing a response that does you more harm than good. Our complaints lead to anger. They lead to bitterness. And even sometimes they lead to depression. God loves you. He doesn't want you hurting yourself because what hurts you hurts him. So complaining hurts you both. If your friends and family hear you complaining all the time, You are bringing them down. Who likes to be around a negative Nancy? Nobody. No one likes to be around Doug and Wendy Weiner, to use a a skit from the old Saturday Night Live days. Nobody likes to be around a bunch of complainers, and God hated it too. It affected the leadership of Moses when his people complained to them. Because not only did Moses feel inadequate for not being able to provide for the people that he led out of Egypt, it led him to complain to God. Why'd you give me these people? Why am I the one in charge? Why Why am I the one having to deal with these stiff-necked people who can't get it? Is it ever proper to complain to God under any circumstances? Attitude is everything. Humble, heartfelt expressions of need are fine. Give us this day our daily bread. We pray that in our Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Don't worry about tomorrow and what it may bring, but I want to take care of today. That doesn't really fit the idea of complaining, but expressions of need that come across as belly aching are out of line. As long as you are focused on today and what God will bring you today, and don't worry about tomorrow because you're worrying about something that hasn't happened yet. And that's what I hear more and more of in today's society, that people are worried about what's going to happen months or weeks when the when, when only thing they need to focus on is today. And that's what the Israelites needed to focus on was today. But they didn't. They couldn't keep their eye on the prize. They kept going back and complaining about the way they had it in Egypt. They kept looking forward to the promised land, and they were worried about when they were going to get there. And they were so worried about when they were going to get there, they never got there. Taking time daily to say thank you to God from the heart is the best way to refocus and get away from your complaining. And the best way that I know (laughs) know to illustrate this is the Israelites spent 40 years in the desert. Jesus spent 40 days because Jesus didn't complain. Jesus knew that it was critical that he go out in the wilderness and be tempted by the devil and give us a good example of how to resist temptation, of how to resist complaining, of how to thwart the devil's uh, attempts to get us to turn away from God because that's what the devil is trying to do. He's trying to make us so dissatisfied with our lot in life, so dissatisfied with our creator that we turn away from him and then we ignore him, and then we don't seek to to uh, to have him strengthen us in our times of need. That's what the devil's after, and he is succeeding at a marvelous rate. Because time and again with people today, 
They'll say, well, why don't you gather with other Christians? Why don't you worship God? Well, I don't like being around hypocrites. My goodness, man, we're all sinners. We're all trying to get into heaven. We're all trying to make it out of this life and get to live eternally with God. But if you don't want to gather up with other people, if you don't want to worship God and give thanks for the many gifts that you've given in this life, where are you going to be on judgment day? Because one thing's for sure, we're going to spend an eternity somewhere. So are you going to choose heaven or hell? And that's the decision that we have to make because we will spend an eternity somewhere. And as for me and my family, I'd like for us to be in heaven. I'd like for us to be around the God who knows what everything that is good for me. Because Satan is not worried about me. Satan is not worried about my family. He doesn't care. He didn't, he wouldn't have cared if Jesus would have thrown himself off the top of the temple and crashed and burned on the pavement below. He wouldn't have cared. But he was trying to tempt Jesus into saying that, no, I'm, I'm not happy with my lot in life. I'm not happy that God sent me down here to rescue these Christians to save these people. So I'm going to outright rebel against him. I'm going to put God to the test. Jesus never did that. Jesus never complained. Even though he was fully human and he asked God if there was any other way to save these people, he willingly sacrificed himself on the cross for us because we were worth it. Well, I would hate to think that I would get to spend eternity with the devil and not with God because of some choices that I made here on earth, that I complained a little too much, that I that I didn't fellowship with other Christians, that I didn't turn to God for strength and and comfort in time of need. Because I realize that I do complain a little bit because there's some things in my life that I really don't like how they're working out. But truth be known, it's it's myself that's backed myself into that corner. I've painted myself into the corner of this room and I expect God to bail me out. And that's not how God works. He does not want us to put him to a foolish test. What is complaining? How would you define it? Is making a negative observation complaining? Two things that are not complaining are observing and grieving. If we go to lunch and the food is terrible and I ask you how the food was, I want you to say that it was terrible. That's not complaining, that's observing. If you find everything terrible, that is complaining. If you go on and on whipping that dead horse, that is complaining. You just need to observe and move on. Yes, we've got manna. That's all we've got to eat. And I may not like it, but God provides. We don't have to plant any crops. We don't have to dig any wells. We don't have to do any of that. God provides every day. That's observing. That's being grateful. That's thanking God for what he's providing because you don't have to put forth any labor, but the Israelites didn't see it that way. They constantly complain. How common is the sin of complaining? Well, that's easy to answer. Just open up the newspaper. What are the letters to the editor all about? They're about complaining. Very few times are they talking about anything That's good. Very few times are they giving praise to anyone. Hang around the water cooler at work to hear employees gripe about the boss's latest bad decision. And then there's the internet. There are a number of websites dedicated to complaining. That's all they do is hear about complaints. If you want to vent, if you want to call out somebody, I mean, you you can do it on any social media site. You can do it on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever you want to do. You can air your complaints. You can vent all you want. You've got to keep it within limits or they'll take it down or they may put you in in prison for a little while. But you can complain all you want and you can vent. And when you start doing that, you may even have people block you because they do not want to hear your complaints or your gripes. There's a lot of things in this life that... uh, that may not be going our way. And then the author hit on one 
this morning I thought that was a little sensitive because it talks about parents or married couples that want to be parents, but God now has not allowed them up to this point to have children. And some people long to get married, but God has not provided the right mate. So maybe there's a lot of things that are going right in their life, but maybe there's a couple of things that they could change if they could. But I want you to hear this. Every one of us is going to have a measure of adversity, and God himself is the one who measured it out. For that reason, every person has something in his or her life that God doesn't want to hear complaints about. Instead of rejoicing in all the good things that God has done in our life, we complain about that one thing. Whatever that may be, we complain about that one thing. And you say, well, it's hard. Well, I know it's hard. It's hard to live with adversity and it's hard not to complain. But listen to me, you are forfeiting them the grace that could help you through that trial by complaining about it. All the grace and strength you need to experience joy and victory is available to you. But by choosing to complain, By clinging to the idol of a perfect life, you are missing the grace of God. So what I would encourage you to do this morning, okay, is give thanks for your adversity in your life, your response to it. That's our attitude. We're responsible for our attitude, how we respond to our adversity. And God is simply not going to tolerate repeated complaints about our adversity. Give thanks for it because it's what brings you closer to him. The devil can quote scripture. The devil knows the Bible backwards and forwards. And time and again, he will tell you that what is the God you deserve, that he doesn't provide everything that you need. You deserve this. You deserve that. God brings adversity into our lives where we can bring closer to him, because that's when we turn back to him. We turn away from our sin, and we stop putting him to a foolish test. So stop complaining about the test that you're wanting God to prove to you and start giving thanks for the many gifts that he's blessed you with in your life. And if you're looking for a church home this morning that is going to preach the full word of God, Tap Methodist Church is going to be open from 1030 to noon for worship service. And if you want to come for Sunday school, it's 915 to 1015. We're located at 715 South McCoy Boulevard in New Boston, Texas. And if you don't come to TAP, do find a church where you can congregate with other Christians, where you can read full scriptures and learn what God is trying to tell you and that you can stray away from complaining and start giving thanks once again for all the the people and the blessings in your life that God has blessed you with. Thank you for joining us this morning and we look forward to seeing you next week for lesson number four.